Our scripture reading this morning comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, and hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do I need to use the podium mic? Lord, we, um, let's pray. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> Father, I come to you as someone who is deeply in need of your grace and mercy. For Lord, I am a sinner. We all find ourselves oftentimes struggling. Struggling to follow you in the midst of a fractious and challenging world. Lord, we do pray right now for our peace within this body, within our families, within our community. For Lord, in a time of division, it can be so easy in our hearts to give space to things that do not honor you. Lord, we can justify anger. We can justify discord and rage and call it holy when deep down within we know it's not. Help us, Lord, to willingly set aside what we think we have a right to say and do to love one another deeply from a pure heart as you call us to in your word. Lord Jesus, your prayer, your high priestly prayer for us was that we would all be one, even as you and the Father are one. Make that true among us now. We pray for our nation in a time of discord, of faction, of violence. We pray against the powers of the evil one that would seek to sow destruction and chaos, sometimes even in your name. Let it not succeed, Lord. We pray that you would keep the witness of your church pure and undefiled. We pray, Lord, that truth would reign. And Lord, even as we have prayed faithfully for our current president, we also pray for our future one. In your word, Lord, you said the heart of the king is as water in your hands. And regardless of our political opinions or affiliations, Lord, help us to pray for our leaders. Help us to trust you knowing that all things are in your hands. And no matter what comes, we need not fear, for you are with us. We pray, Lord, that in the years ahead, you would help us, Lord, as your word says, to be able to live peaceable and quiet lives. That we would be able to worship you in liberty and freedom. And that we, Lord, out of our freedom would not use our freedom as your people for our own ends, but for the good of our neighbor, that you above all else might be praised and glorified in a world that does not know you. For our desire, Lord, is not for our kingdoms to come, 
but for yours to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I had the opportunity this week to watch a movie that I've been wanting to see for quite some time. Uh, Perhaps some of you like old war movies. Well, this is a new movie about an old war, uh, 1917. Uh, Some of you may have seen that. It's a really interesting film. It's designed to be filmed as though it's following one scene continually throughout the whole movie. It's really creative. But it's the story of a British corporal, Corporal Schofield, And he's serving in the trenches of France during World War I. Uh, For those of you who've read about World War I, you know how brutal of a fight that was. And this movie spares no image of that. But he's given the task of carrying a crucial message to a regiment of the British Army that had become detached from the rest of the army. The enemies had cut their communication lines, and so they couldn't pass orders. So he had to run across no man's land. Um, to go to this regiment to deliver a crucial message because this regiment was planning an attack against the German lines, but it was on bad intelligence. And the attack, which would involve 1,600 men, would certainly result in the destruction of that entire regiment and the loss of all those lives. His message contains better intelligence and the command to call off the assault The movie is the story of his journey to deliver that message. And along the way, he demonstrates this indefatigable courage. Um, he, He knows how crucial this message was. And he risks his life uh, to deliver it. But in the midpoint of the movie, he comes across another unit on its way to another place in the battle. And when he explains his mission to the commanding officer, that commanding officer takes him aside and says to him quietly, when you deliver the message to that battlefield commander, make sure there are witnesses. Schofield responds, but it's an order from the general. Surely he'll follow. Surely he's going to follow it. The commanding officer again responds, make sure there are witnesses. For some men, just like the fight. Some men just like the fight. It was a sober message, but it's a comment that proved to be true for when Schofield arrives with the message right in the nick of time. There there are people crawling out of the trenches about to engage the Germans. The commander resists receiving the message or even opening it. Schofield has to plead with him to open it. That scene is incredibly intense, and you can feel the warring desires within the commander, leaving you as the viewer to wonder, what's he going to do? Is the message going to be received, or is he going to go on with the fight to certain disaster? You see, this conflict isn't about which course of action is wisest. This internal conflict that that commanding officer is dealing with. It's not about wisdom. His conflict is a, it's about competing desires within him. One of which the audience knows is clearly wrong. But it's difficult to see for him at the time. He loved the fight. His whole body and emotions were geared for the fight. But he also knew he was a man under authority and he needed to follow orders. Some men just love the fight. Perhaps you can relate. Anyone who has struggled with sin knows this scene intimately and can feel that internal war going on inside of the commander. This internal conflict of competing desires And due to the deceitfulness of sin, we can sometimes wonder in the moment, which is the desire I should lean into? Which is the desire I should be led by and let win? When after the fact, the choice really was clear all along. Our passage today addresses this conflict directly, setting over it the lens of our spiritual life as Christians. 
Paul tells us that the impact of the gospel is not just this transaction of righteousness where because of Christ's death we're forgiven of our sins and because of his perfect life we're given uh, his his perfection as, as as a gift. That is the gospel, but it's also transformational. It's transactional and transformational because it's a relationship and all relationships change us. It's transformational as he places his spirit within us and gives us life and strength to become what he has made us to be. Last week we talked about how we are freed from relying on God's law and freed for obedience to God's law of love. This week we're talking about how we grow in that obedience. And growth happens as we battle. Growth happens as we battle. That's what I want you to take away from today. That led by God's Spirit, we must battle as Christians to align what we do with who we already are in Christ. Led by God's Spirit, we must battle to align what we do with who we are in Christ. Just as the choice that commander made mattered, very much to 1,600 men's lives. What we choose and what desires we give ear to matter. And God provides us everything we need to grow in doing what pleases him. So how do Christians experience this gospel transformation? Well, our passage today opens with a command. It says, So I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This command follows on the previous section. It's a difficulty preaching from a book, is that every sermon is connected to the previous one. And so this command is really the concluding statement from last week and the introductory statement for this week. But what it means when you connect it all together is that walking by the Spirit is the way you overcome sinful desires and grow in obedience to God's command for us to love one another, back in verses 13 and 14. But the way he writes this command in verse 16 is really important. It's easy to gloss over it, but I want you to see this. Um, Because it's backwards from what we would normally think. He doesn't say that if you avoid sinning, you'll walk with God's spirit. As in, you know, you do good, and you'll be close to God. You know, some of us think about sin this way. We we probably didn't when we came to faith, but we do now often. When do you feel most distant from the Lord? It's when you've struggled with entertaining sin. It's when you've done something wrong that you feel does not please God. You feel distant from him. And then you get things in order, you apologize, you make things right, and you feel closer to him again. But no, Paul flips that idea completely around, and he makes it into a promise. He says, you walk by the Spirit, and you'll overcome the controlling power of sin. You know, that word there, which is translated, will not gratify the desires of the flesh, it's emphatic, and it means no way, no how, ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Walk by the Spirit, and in no way, will you gratify the desires of the flesh? The relationship comes first. That walking with the Lord comes first. And it produces the obedience. It's not what comes because of the obedience. And this distinction is crucial if we're to understand how Christian growth happens. Let me take a step back for a moment and share with you an Old Testament passage. If you've been here for a few of my sermons, you know I always go back to the Old Testament. And I think in understanding this, there is a passage that's in Paul's mind um, that it's not immediately clear as he writes this section. It's from Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. Ezekiel was an Old Testament prophet who lived and ministered during the time God's people had been exiled to Babylon. It was an incredibly difficult time, and that journey into exile was painful and uncomfortable. Ezekiel and Jeremiah ministered at the same time, but Jeremiah was with people who were left in Jerusalem, 
and Ezekiel was with the downtrodden and broken people um, in the canal regions of Babylon. And what he gave them, what his job was, was to help them understand why they were suffering and where their hope was for the future. And what he wrote to them was a message of hope and promise to help this diminished and downcast people know that God was with them and that he'd restore them. He wrote not only about God's people going back and coming again to their homeland. He wrote about how God would make it so they never had to go into exile again. How God would change them so that his loving relationship with them would never be fractured the way it had been when it led them into exile. Looking to this future, Ezekiel wrote, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And here's the key. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What an amazing statement that is. Do you see what this says? God's promise to send his spirit to them. The spirit we receive through faith in Christ. That It's not because they've kept his law that they get this gift. But it's to cause them to keep his law. It's to strengthen them for the life of obedience. It's to lead them. It's to equip them with everything they need to turn from sin to faith in Christ. His promise is... Not to give us this external standard and tell us to keep it. His promise is to change us from the inside out by sending his spirit to live within us. He takes his law, this external constraint, and he makes it a part of who they are. If you are in Christ, the law is written on your heart. It's not this external thing for you to obey so that you can feel close to God. Because you are close to God. He causes you and works within you to produce the desire to do what is pleasing to him. He causes us to desire what is good. The transforming work of the Spirit of God is a change from the inside out. It's not just a call to do better, to live better, to choose better, to obey a new set of laws. No, it's a new identity. It's a new heart a new set of motivating desires and a call to live according to them. But you know what? If you know Jesus, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. You know this. You've experienced this, whether or not you realize it. We just tend to forget it after a while. You know, I grew up as a Christian in a Christian home that I am extremely grateful for. By God's grace, I've never known a day when I didn't know the Lord. So I've certainly had my struggles and my questions and my doubts. But I know many of you and many of my uh, friends and others who can remember when they didn't know the Lord or, or came to know him as an adult. Is that an experience for any of you that you came to know the Lord as an adult? Why don't you just raise your hand and let me know. It's many of you. Praise God. What a beautiful testimony. Did change happen when you came to faith? Did something shift? Did something move within you? Did you get a new set of desires? Were there things that you longed to do after you came to faith that you didn't long to do before? And when you look back on that old life, are there things that you see that you wonder, how did I ever desire that? Of course. That's the Spirit of God in you, moving you to keep God's law. Now, the old ones didn't go away completely, but something changed. And your heart was oriented in a new direction. But you know, the journey doesn't end the moment we receive God's spirit, does it? <laughs> that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, that'd be nice if we just arrived. Any of you still struggle with sin? Yeah, you don't have to raise your hands, it's fine. Of course, it's not all sunshine and daisies, as they say. No, as Christians, we experience a battle that we are called to engage in. Because just like that commanding officer in 1917, we still have our sinful nature opposing us. It's with us. Opposing the Spirit's work in making us like Christ. That's what verse 17 says in our text uh, for today. 
It says, for the, um, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you want. I inserted a word there, able, because it's a little bit better translation. Helps us in understanding this. They're in opposition so that you are not able to do what you want. Paul writes that we have an ongoing battle within ourselves, just as we still live in a broken world in which we see both the beauty of God and the chaos and pain of our fallen humanity. So also we experience conflict internally as we battle with competing desires. In fact, our sinful nature prevents us often from following God perfectly. It fights against our growth. This is a message that's all throughout the New Testament. It's in Romans 7, um, where Paul writes, um, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. I can relate to that at points in my life. I can look back and think how foolish I was to make certain decisions. But at the time, it was almost like I couldn't make any other decision. I had this battle, and I felt like I was losing. So if we're prevented from obedience, then how do we grow? Well, to fill in the gap with the rest of Galatians, it's not the answer of the legalists who simply say you need to try harder and do better. It's not the answer which we talked about last week, which is taking the grace of God as a license to sin. That's Romans 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to all that. It's not license. It's not legalism. The answer is a third and better way that is above them both, and we find it in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Hmm. Now, at first glance, this may appear to make no sense. What does being under the law have to do with anything that he's been talking about? Let me tell you a little bit. Let me give you an illustration. Think for a moment of a person who has spent most of their lives working on a farm for a wage. Perhaps that's some of your experience. It wasn't mine. I grew up in the suburbs. Um, But think of a person who spent most of their lives working on a farm for a wage. They get paid maybe by the amount of produce they bring in from the field. Now that produces in them all sorts of temptations, right? Maybe they're struggling to get up to their quota or whatever. They might want to take produce from someone else's basket. They may want to work extra hard so they can earn as much as possible so they won't need to go and slave in the field anymore. They may decide that working this way really isn't worth it and just quit. You know, I think this describes many of us as Christians as we think about the Christian life and obedience. Obedience sometimes isn't joyful. It isn't free. And the list of sins in our passage in verses 19 through 21 may sometimes seem more attractive to us or just simply impossible to overcome than is really worth the cost This type of Christian faith is driven by duty. But what happens when that person moves from being a laborer in the field to owning the farm? Do their motivations change? Do their desires shift? Yes, they do. Their motivations switch entirely. Now they're happiest when they're most productive. What satisfies them the most is that they bear much fruit. They bring about the produce of of the land in a way that um, that shows that all their labor and what they have is of benefit. They grow to love the land and the fruit of their labor. All of these temptations they used to have all of a sudden take a different shape because their relationship with the work has changed. And they're now free to enjoy both the work and the produce. And the work becomes part of who they are. Not this external job that isn't part of who they are. So it is with us. Because we have a new relationship with God's law, it's come inside of us. We're not under it, it's in us. And we have, therefore, a new relationship with God 
we're united with Christ and given a new identity in him, to conform our lives to the pattern of Christ isn't duty. It's our joy, and it's rooted in love and identity. We're the owners of the field. We long to see it bear fruit. Christ has freed us, and we long for that free life to produce fruit in keeping with who we are in him. It's not that we take a passive approach to sin and obedience. No, we work with our whole hearts, just like the owner of the land will spend hours tirelessly laboring to ensure that his work is productive. But we do it without the same burdens we had before. Not as people who need to earn something from God, but people who already have all that we need in him. We battle against our sinful desires and for obedience because our controlling motivation, again, is love. So we are to let God's Spirit lead us into a liberating obedience. We battle by humbly submitting to God's Spirit freely and working in joy to know and follow Christ. But what about the last bit of this passage? Paul gives us a warning that if we read can be a little scary. He provides us with a sample list of sins which cover areas of sexual immorality um, and sexual sin, idolatry, destructive behavior in relationships, turmoil, dissension, factions. You can think of some of that today. Um, And also substance abuse. That's what those last couple are. You know, a whole sermon could be spent unpacking all of those. And that would be a whole lot of fun. No. I'm not here for fun. That's, that has its value. But that's not my focus today. This is just really an example list for Paul. Instead, reflecting on this list, I, each of us can see ourselves in some way represented here. And that's what Paul's point is. And so when Paul writes that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, we wonder what it means for us. Well, I know Jesus, but I sin this way. I struggle with this. I struggle with anger. I struggle with lust. I struggle with all of these different things. So what does it mean for us? I wouldn't dare to think that a single one of us is entirely free from these sins. But the question is not whether or not we sin. Remember, this is just one part of a whole book that's been about God's grace. We do and we will sin. The question is, what are you ruled by? Which desires rule you? What desires are we submitted to? And that's what that phrase, live like this, means. It doesn't mean stumble. It means that your life is given over to those things. For the Christian, this is a reminder that we are not to get lazy in the battle. What you do with your freedom matters. And like we said last week, it's given to you for a purpose. Not for selfish ambition and indulgence in those freedoms. But to love one another deeply, from a pure heart, in humility. That's why you have your freedom. We have a responsibility and what we do matters because it demonstrates who we really are. When we give quarter to sin and let it rule in any area of our lives, we are actually trying to live as two different people, one enslaved and the other free. And it causes an internal tension that will never last and always destroys. We feel the conflict. But as we submit in every area of our lives to being led by the Spirit of God, though we will struggle The same power that brought Christ from the dead and gave us salvation works in us to transform us so that, as Paul writes in Ephesians 4, we will grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ Jesus our Lord. He transforms us by his power as we are led by the Spirit of God. The sinner who trusts in Christ doesn't need to fear For our obedience was never the standard for our acceptance. Christ's sacrifice for you is enough, brothers and sisters. It accomplishes both your salvation 
and your transformation as you trust in him and submit to his leading. In conclusion, I do want to reflect on one application of this. And it comes from that list of sins in, at the end of, of the passage. When he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, and then he lists out hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions. These are challenges for us. These are challenges for us when we're on Facebook. <laughs> They're challenges for us when we have conversation around the dinner table. They're challenges for us in our own hearts when we watch the news, when we read about the happenings in D.C. this past week, or in the world around us. Discord, factions, fits of rage and dissensions. Brothers and sisters, if discord over these issues is destroying your relationships or undermining your love for one another and God's people, ask yourself if you like the fight too much. Be self-critical. Ask yourself, have I submitted to the Spirit's leading in this area of my life? Or am I choosing a sinful desire over one that honors God? and prioritizes love of neighbor over love of my own freedom. You know, I think, when I think of this passage, I think of Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. When the temple guard was coming to arrest Jesus and Peter, that hothead, he rips out his knife and he slashes off the ear of, of, the, of the guard that's coming to arrest Jesus. He loved the fight. He wanted to defend what he believed, and, and this man he, he cared for, and he lashed out in discord and violence. But what did Jesus do? He first went to the man who was injured, the man who Peter thought was Jesus' enemy, and he healed him. That's our calling with our enemies. And then he said to Peter, Put away your sword. Don't you know that those who live by the sword will die by it? Think of how that picture relates to us, brothers and sisters, as we engage our culture this week in a time of brokenness and discord. How can we love one another and respond to those around us like Jesus, not like Peter? What we do matters. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Savior, you are our King. And Lord, we can forget in the midst of a world when we see struggles and difficulties, we can forget that your kingdom is greater than anything. That you are always on the throne and we need not fear for you are with us. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves through your eyes. To, in humility, submit ourselves to your leading. That you might change us and transform us from the inside out to become more like Christ. Help us to know when to fight. Help us to know when to seek peace. Help us to know when to reach out with healing. Help us to know when to reach out with words of challenge. Above all else, Lord, help us to be one. That those in this world who do not know you might see in us the picture of your promised salvation. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I forgot our hymnal, so I'm going to need you to sing loud the last words of this, um, 
of this song that we'll be joining in together to sing as we leave. There we go. Grace greater than our sin. Pardon me, I'm going to look up at the screen behind me. Yes. Actually, you know what? I'm going to just come and stand here and sing with all of you. <laughs> Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is garden and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. Brothers and sisters, please rise and receive this benediction. God's grace is truly greater than our sin. So no matter where you are this week, go with God. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord to love your neighbor as yourself, to be salt and light, and a witness to the gospel in a world that so desperately needs it. May God go with you, brothers and sisters. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.